South Africa, the continent's biggest success story and one of the most stunning countries in the world. It's me and the tourist, don't judge me. I'm way too cool for things like that. But this country has a very dark past. As a black man, I wouldn't have even been allowed to set foot on this very beach just 20 years ago. For over a century, a white supremacist government controlled the nation and brutally oppressed black people. They've got no education. They've only just come down from the trees. This system of racial separation was called apartheid and was only abolished in 1994 when Nelson Mandela and the ANC came to power. Today marks the dawn of our freedom. There has been such extreme levels of segregation here, and knowing that that ended only two decades ago, I'm desperate to see how that has changed the lives of people just like me, if at all. Poverty is rife here, and today people talk of a new underclass emerging. It's not black people. That's the way to do it. But why? I can't imagine anything worse than waking up in there. We are going to take that belongs to us. With years of hatred to overcome. They're going to kill us. And both sides still playing the race card. Most white people learned black people the things they know today. I want to find out what life is like for the young white South Africans. Some of them now are very racist. Who think they are now bottom of the pile. It's not a place to live here, not for the children. If you are black, you're better off. If I was a white guy, that would piss me off. And discover whether the nation will ever move on from its tortured past. Stupid man. We will never agree. Never. That's why the world is a fucker. Johannesburg, South Africa's biggest city. 20 years on from apartheid, some people claim that this country is still governed by racist policies. Only this time, they say it's white people, not black people, being oppressed. What the white experience of Africa is, for me, is really, really intriguing. Some people believe since the ANC came into power, there's been a flip because all of the opportunities have been afforded to the black people and the white people are now second-class citizens and are being neglected. But that can't be the case, surely. On the edge of the city lies a notorious camp called Coronation Park, a place where some of the hardest-hit white South Africans have made their home. Coronation Park fills me with a little bit of apprehension and that apprehension is based on the way that they may take me the way they may receive me and the way they may judge me straight away because I'm a privileged young black man. This made me a little bit more nervous <laughs> thinking about it. During apartheid, Coronation Park was a picnic place for white middle-class families, but it's become something very different. Oh, this is it. A permanent home for a white underclass. It's a camp in the middle of a park. They're living in a rough trailer park. In the UK, you sort of get used to seeing images of young black kids in poverty, and I've never seen those same images, but with white children. I'm really thrown by that. It's... Outsiders aren't generally welcome. All new arrivals need permission to be here from the camp leader, Irene, who's lived here for eight years. She's agreed to let me stay. To see white people in South Africa barefoot in a settlement in a park, that's blowing my mind. Yeah. <laughs> because that is not what we see uh, across, you know, across the pond. I mean, we don't yeah. see that in, in Europe. What's the common thread? What normally brings people here? I don't know. I think because they lost everything, there's no jobs for the white people. That understand me. I'm not racist or there's no jobs for our white people. You want paycheck away from this place. Mm. Because something can happen to you and you will end up here. 
the settlement sort of stretches all the way down. Can we have a little look? Do you mind yes, taking me around? Yes, yeah, I will okay? take you around and you can check. Coronation Park, it's like a white squatter camp. Yep. It's like you can stay here and uh, we will look after you. Do they build their own shacks? Do they have to pay to be here? No, they don't pay to be here. That's literally a shed, is that? Does someone live in this? In the back of it, yeah. Wow. How many people are there in Coronation Park? Uh, 287. Hello. Hello. We're running on generators. We haven't got power yet. With no proper sanitation and dozens of stray animals roaming around, health is a real concern. The government has repeatedly tried to shut the camp down as new people arrive all the time. How you doing? I'm, I'm Reggie. What's your name? JD. JD, hello. 27 year old artist JD turned up last month with his mum, two kids, and pregnant wife. That's absolutely beautiful. That's what I do. I travel the whole country. Painting and going all over the place. So, where have you come from? Originally from Cape Town. How have you ended up here in Coronation Park? I've been hit by life, you know? Hit to my knees. You know, it's difficult for white folks these days. It really is. We don't have the ball in our court anymore. Um, we are not the chosen ones, if you want to put it that way, and it's the truth. Most white South Africans are descended from Dutch settlers and called Afrikaners. During apartheid, they saw themselves as a superior race. We cannot mix with the lower nations unless they are cultivated. Given the best jobs and education, creating a super wealthy white elite. In 1990, everything changed. The leader of the black resistance, Nelson Mandela, was released from prison. While over 50% of privately held assets here are still owned by the white minority, Africana charities believe a new underclass has formed, with many living in settlements just like this one. Where should I put my tent? Where's a good place to pitch up? What do you mean, there? I'm going to put it on the ash. <laughs> Will you guys help me put on my tent? Yeah. Come on, then. What are we doing? There we go. All right, let's peg this up. Yay. I've only stayed in the tent once before. And um, while I was making it, I wasn't getting whipped in the ass by some, uh, some kid called Winston. <laughs> when did you do this? Right, look, 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 look. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Nearly a third of all the people living here are under 16. I'm not sure how the future looks for teenagers like Winston. Do you think you'll always live here? I don't know. Do you want to move out of here? Yes. Why? It's the people that's only drinking and fighting, kicking. Really? So if you do move out of here and people ask you where you grew up when you're older, when you're my age, are you going to say Coronation Park? Why? There's some people who's going to make fun of me. Are you going to look after me and give me some um, sandwiches <laughs> and tea before bed? No, I'll give you some food. <laughs> Can I help out? After dark, more young people flood into the camp. As well as child benefits, many residents survive on handouts, including hot drinks and sandwiches given out three nights a week. You ask them how much coffee they want. Say, who feel? Who feel? Coffee. Coffee. Drink yay. Drink yay. That's right. Coffee or tea? Coffee or tea? Learn Afrikaans. Check that out. How you been, man? You had a good day? What have you been doing? Um, drinking. <laughs> drinking today? This is the pain. Hey, evening. He's a little mad. <laughs> I didn't think about what the rain would do here. Unemployment here is very high. One person who does have a steady job is Irene's son, Kheri. He works as a welder. Hey, Hedy. I'm good, thank you, man. I've not met you before. I'm Reggie. Hello. Hello, lovely to meet you. Is that your wedding pictures I can see yeah. over there? You scrub up well, don't you? Yeah, so He looks good in a suit. <laughs> Flowers from the wedding day. Yeah. You've still got them. <laughs> I don't want to grow them. <laughs> yeah, right. 
Despite Hedy working, his wage isn't enough to cover rent for a proper house for his wife and three kids. Just how difficult is it to raise a small child in, in a place like this? It is difficult because the generator is on, but when you sleep at night and he wakes up, the generator isn't on. Then you must struggle to get light and what, whatsoever. Mm. And there isn't always hot water because you must make fire to get hot water. So yeah, that's a problem. Do you worry about how, um, how, how healthy a situation it is for him? Because I'd imagine yes, that it's probably quite easy for him to get ill. This place is dirty, you know. Especially with the small one uh, and Zander, they, they get sick fast, you know. It's not a place to live here, not for the children. You can't live here anymore. I tried my best from the start. I, I was working since I was 16, you know. Um, and from then, I, I, I just tried, you know. Uh, build up my education and, and, and try to be what I am. You look quite emotional. Yeah, yes. Yeah, when it like... comes to my kids and my wife, yeah. What is it about your family that makes you so emotional? Uh, I think it's because uh, I know I try hard, you know. Uh, Maybe I don't try hard enough, I don't know, but to, to see them suffer like this, it, it makes me... Do you think your children are suffering? Um, well, they don't have the life, what I want for them, you know, and I, I, I think that for them is suffering, you know. The harsh reality of being at the bottom of the ladder out here is that that can happen to you. This is it for them. Kind of keep you awake, wouldn't it? the next one on for you. You're going to chop off my fingers, bro. You don't need your fingers. Ah, uh, come on, bro. You're slapping like a saucy man. <laughs> Use this thing, bro. That's the way to do it. You're going to go home smelling like smoke, that's a guarantee, bro. I can live with that so long as I'm warm. What was your first night like here? Terrible, because it felt like there's a bunch of serial killers staying here. <laughs> I'm really glad I asked you this question after my first night. Sleeping here as a grown man is one thing, but in a few months, JD will have a newborn baby to share his tent with. How does it feel knowing that your newborn will be brought here? I'm talking to Irene and them. They all know about the baby coming. And I know in my heart it will be OK, because they're going to help us. They will help us. I've heard about it recently. I've read in the papers that the people around here might qualify for government housing. But Why wouldn't know, you, though? I mean, if ever there was anybody that needed help, particularly with a baby on the way, I would have thought that you'd be, you'd be perfect for it. To me, government housing is, is, is a dream. <laughs> I don't quite... Um, I, don't, I don't see myself qualifying for government housing. Over two million people are waiting for social housing in South Africa. So it's no surprise that JD doubts his chances of getting one. The wider situation is even more complicated, as race still plays a part in some opportunities here. I've come to the centre of Joburg to meet an old mate of mine, celebrity DJ Sizway, to get a different perspective. What's happening now for young black South Africans? Oh, Rage, what's up? How you doing? It's been years. <laughs> I'm well, thanks. How's it going with good you? See. I'm really good, man. I'm really good. I'm glad to be in, a, in your neck of the woods, as it were. OK, let's go to yeah. where you know. Take you where the girls are. <laughs> <laughs> You're desperately trying to get me in trouble, my it's girlfriend, all is a right? Good, it's a good start. <laughs> Sizwe is what's known here as a black diamond, a young black guy with a very healthy bank balance. People refer to you as a black diamond. I guess some people would. <laughs> I'm a diamond in the rough. <laughs> I need some polishing. <laughs> but people like Sizwe are relatively rare. 
Most of the wealth here is still in the hands of the old white masters, and they live in lavish, gated communities. Is this one property? Yeah. The houses, they're just obscene. There's a huge gap in SA between those that have and those that don't. Is that why the walls are so high and the security? That's why the so... walls are so high. I mean, look, this is barbed That's wire, like, there's gates. Yeah, electronic fences. Yeah. To try to rebalance wealth and opportunity, the government has brought in a policy called Affirmative Action, AA for short. It's already transformed areas like the courtroom where over 60% of the most senior judges are now black. And the dream is to repeat that across all walks of life. In SA, if you are black, you're better off right now. Well, why is that? Because it wasn't the case 20 years ago. Just because of everything, man. Like, the odds are stacked to your favor now. Affirmative action. If I applied for a job, right, and a guy my age, same education as me, applied for the same position, uh, but he was white, I'd get the job, hands down. I mean, as a, if I was a white guy, that would piss me off. Thank you, brother. You all right? Talking to Sizwe in the car, you know, one of the things that kept coming up was the um, the swing of power and the white people feeling marginalised, you know, and feeling that they don't get the opportunities anymore. Reverse racism, I guess. It's a very different time now, and if you're black, you will get opportunities in the way that you never used to. I've grown up thinking equality is about treating everyone the same, but here, things are different. Until the 90s, on these very streets, the ruling whites, or Boers, treated black people as little better than animals. I don't like apartheid, because in apartheid, Europeans go up and Africans go down. They were forcibly removed from their homes to live together in massive ring fence compounds, which later grew into townships. Everything was ruthlessly enforced by the white regime. I want to find out what it was like living under white rule on these streets. So I've come to meet 28-year-old Colin. He grew up in Alexandra, a township still full of black people, many living in poverty. As a kid, you were actually, well, I guess, old enough, at seven or eight, to remember... So between that age, yes. Yeah, to remember some of the things that happened during apartheid. What, what sticks out in your mind during that era? I remember when we called them the Melo Yellow Vans. It was the police state vans. Immediately, you see that yellow van. You knew you had to run to save your life because you never knew what would be predicted from the police or the state police. Because at times, they would just literally stop to beat you up or not want you to congregate in the streets in groups. And even today, you know, police these are not the most likeable people in the townships, for example, for that matter. People see a, a police van, they see their enemy. In the mind of somebody like myself from the UK, when we think of segregation, the first thing that comes to mind is, is the US in the 60s and the, the struggles of black people in America. But this was going on in the 90s. In the 90s, yes. I is, mean, it's so hard to get your head around. That's unbelievable. I mean, the last time it happened, it is 1994, which is, sounds like yesterday. Black people who broke the apartheid laws were sent to prisons like this one, called the Old Fort. Nelson Mandela was incarcerated here whilst awaiting trial. The only time you would find white wardens in this section, it was when they came to render humiliation towards the black prisoners. They would perform a strip search dance called the Tausa dance. Strip search dance? What was the dance? The dance stipulated you strip naked, you spread your legs, you spread your arms, clap the hands above the head, leap in the air making a clicking sound, stretch your legs, like stretch your legs. And if no object had fallen down, then the authorities would go in an extent of inserting a finger or a torch inside their rectums to see if there's nothing hidden. It was a alleged torch. that a torch. Men and women. Men and women, yes. Wow. The most severe punishments were reserved for those who fought to change the system. These freedom fighters were kept in solitary confinement as a warning to others. Political leaders were sent here. It was the most severe form of punishment. Lying down flat on the ground, you feel like you're lying down in a grave. So there weren't beds in here, there weren't a desk, there weren't chairs. There were not beds, no chairs. On the floor. They were locked up here for 23 hours and only released for an hour of the day. Okay. 
guess this is where uh, prisoners were chained to. It's amazing to think South Africa has gone from official government brutality towards black people to affirmative action, from just my parents' generation to mine. There's been so much injustice here that the anger is still so fresh. And just putting my mum's face to this environment makes me angry. And that's just imagining it, not living it. On face value, it's bang out of order that white people aren't being given the same opportunities as black people. But when you think about how long it's been weighed in the favour of the minority, you can understand why it's been put in place. I'm not saying that I agree with it, but what I am saying is I get why so many people are still angry and why they think that it is imperative that it's in place. Although black and white South Africans now enjoy all the same freedoms, Statistics South Africa claims that nearly 16 million black people still live in poverty here. On that level, extra help for them makes sense. I'm holding the bat the right way, it's a good start. But I'm not sure where that leaves the squatters in Coronation Park. I can't help wondering what people like Irene make of it. After being part of the privileged minority, for years. Do you think that it's fair? Do you think it's right? I think, yeah. Uh, you do? If, you, <laughs> you know what? Fair? You know what? If, that's what I say, and I say it today, if our fathers and our fathers and fathers and fathers treat the black people like normal people and didn't uh, let them work like, like slaves and treat them like dogs, maybe it would be different today. That's, that's the way it's life. Because yeah. it's time now for us to pay for what our fathers did. And there's nothing you can do about that. Irene strikes me as being resigned to her fate, but her son, Kheri, is desperate to get his family out of here. Your mum said that she thinks it's almost a little bit like a balance now. It's almost more fair for the black people. Do you agree with that or disagree? I think that's bullshit. 20 years ago, I still had fuckle. So now I've got nothing, now they, they think it's balanced out. What happened years ago with, with the black people and the white people was nothing to do with me. I wasn't there, I didn't fight the battles with the white people and the black people. So you're saying your generation have done nothing to deserve this, is that no, how you no. feel? Yeah, that's how I feel. Most, most white people learned black people the things they know today, mm. especially in my company as well. And at the end, they walk out, get a better job with my knowledge, and we sit in the shit hole where we are today. But they feel marginalised. They feel that they're still suffering from the people that, 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 that caused the apartheid, you know? The time when, when it was like the Bure, when they called themselves Bure, had the country in their hands. There was more food in our country, more job opportunities. That was also the apartheid, though, right, when the Bure were in charge? Yeah. But so they still, was... still the black people had jobs, and they were still... They had uh, no rights, though. Yeah, they didn't have, have rights. But even though white people, what rights do we have? No, but then, at that time, it wasn't anything like now. Yeah, it wasn't. I can't, I, I can't say, people. because I wasn't there. It's a black government, it's a black country. They don't want, want white people here. That's what I think. Some of the stuff that he said made my blood boil. I don't agree with his views. But he wants a better life for his son, and he feels that the way things are, that's just not going to happen. Being in this, and this being your world in its entirety, I understand why you might feel that way. It may sit uncomfortably, but at least part of the reason Kheri is stuck here could be because of affirmative action. And if it continues, I worry that Coronation Park could keep growing, creating more race resentment for young people in South Africa. It's mad how different this place is in the dark, isn't it? I just think it's a bit more intimidating, because you just don't know where you are, what's around, and um, what you're walking into, you know? Definitely is a different vibe here. <laughs> hey, guys. Hi, hi. <laughs> but you for the true to... camp experience, you have to sit in the stump. There's a very dangerous spider around you. In Afrikaans, you call it a suck spinner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that thing can kill you. Why are you saying that before I sit down on the stump? <laughs> I don't want a suck spinner getting in my bum. If the 
the way things are set up here, there are so many hurdles for you to get back to where you were. There are things in the way that aren't your fault. And that just makes me angry. I can't really say it's not my fault. I ended up here for a reason. Nobody comes in here just because the country screwed up. Nobody comes in here like that. They come in here because they screwed up. You can't blame everything on the system. No, that's the first time I've heard ownership since I've been here. <laughs> ownership. <laughs> it's the first time I've heard ownership. Even a rich guy can find himself here in two weeks. Ask me. I've lost everything. In me. I lived a dream. I was a rock star. Oh, in my head, I still am. <laughs> I used to sign boobs for a living, you know? <laughs> and I, I, I had a selfish life, but I lived the dream. Mm -hmm. and, and everything that went along with it, I had. And I lost it in a couple of days. Just a few years ago, JD was living in his own house with a pool. But since his music career ended, he struggled to find his feet in modern South Africa and has been moving with his mum from place to place. This camp is full of people who've left their homes but don't know where they'll end up. Coronation Park isn't the only place that poor whites are squatting. Local newspapers report there are now over 80 camps dotted around Pretoria. This was once the spiritual homeland of the Afrikaner nation, but in modern South Africa, the idea of a nation where white people are in charge clearly has no future. It's not like a, a block of flats in its most traditional sense, but it definitely looks run down. It seems to be both black and white here as well. This settlement is an abandoned care home. As well as the poor Afrikaners, it's home to lots of recent black immigrants from all over the continent. Black or white, this place really does feel like the end of the line. I'm Reggie. That's what I'm just... Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hello, can we come in? Yeah, come in. Is that all right? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hey, how you doing? I'm, uh, I'm Reggie. Brilliant. Nice to meet you, Vivian. Is this your little one? Is that your, is that your youngster? Yeah. Is that your baby and this, this one here? This is my first one. This okay. is my second one. Oh, wow, congratulations. So is this your family in here then, yeah? Yeah. How old are you guys? I'm 20 and he's 24. How long have you guys lived here then? Uh, we've lived here for basically four years now. Who else lives in here? Because there's doors all the way down the corridor and they're all sealed. It's only white. It's only white. There's um... no black in, in those rooms. There's three or four other buildings here. Do the blacks sort of keep to themselves? Yeah. Most of the time. Most of the time, Most yeah. Of the time. Why do you think that is? Some of them are very racist. And inside here, yeah, they're also very racist. Yeah. Most of the people, if they do know you and they do have respect for you, they actually just intend to leave you alone. You leave them alone, they will leave you alone. The only other place where I've heard someone speak like that is prison. <laughs> That's the only other place where I've heard people speak about That's like that, looking yeah. after yourself. Is that how you see That's it? That's how it works here in this place. So, yeah. Do you know what? I'd love to see the, um, the rest of this building. Is it possible for you to show me yeah. around? Can I see some more? It's a bit dark down here. So yeah, no kidding. My grandmother's staying here. Well, Vivian's grandmother, actually. Wow, so it's the whole family all in this. Yeah, well, it's the mother. The little one just here. <laughs> Go. It's the grandmother and Vivian's mother that actually got us here, yeah, so... So what's this through here? Is this shared? Everything's shared, but unfortunately not everything works either. The toilets, they're permanently blocked. These tubs, they don't work at all. They got water, but only cold water. Yeah. Showers. Hey, look at that. Needles, drugs. So that's everywhere now? Yeah. Too many drug dealers moved in, too many junkies moved in. We all know that it's not safe for the kids. Yeah. Crime is rife here, but that's not the only danger. 
These buildings are so old, if these roofs catch fire, it's, it's over, it's done. Two months ago, a resident built a fire in their room to keep warm. Unfortunately, it got out of control and tore through an entire building. This is awful. Do people actually live in here still? Do people still actually live here? God. 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 There's at least a roof over their heads. I can't imagine anything worse than waking up in there. I think in, what, 20 minutes it was the whole wing. This is the, the hardest I think I've seen it in, in South Africa, you know. So what's the future look like for your, uh, your little girl then? In South Africa, I wouldn't say too good. Neither Hardis nor Vivian have a legitimate job. To get by, they run an unlicensed shop out of their window. It's difficult for us to get work in South Africa, especially me. When I just moved into Pretoria 2010, I had 60 CVs that I actually uh, gave out, resumes that I gave out to places, and it's difficult to find work in South Africa. Not even once is I'm going to call you back. Nothing. Why do you think it's so hard? Working places are racist as well. Not racist. You need more black em uh, employment than whites. Yeah. It's, it's how they work. If, you, if your skin color is not correct, unfortunately, you're not going to get it. And this is at quarter so not my back here. So With no know. job, the family lives hand to mouth. So tonight's dinner depends on the little money the shop makes, which today was nothing. Unfortunately, there's no money to buy anything tonight, but I've still got some macaroni left and soup, so that's what we'll be eating tonight. Macaroni and soup. That's what you have here, yeah? That's what I have here for now. I don't want to seem judgmental. Yeah. Anyway, but just, it almost feels like this isn't... This isn't a life. <laughs> Like anyone, I find it hard to witness poverty. But here in South Africa, it is very common. Their Institute of Race Relations claims a staggering 45% of black South Africans also live below the breadline. But that doesn't make the plight of poor whites any easier to stomach. I can hear some music playing. Who's playing that music? Uh, all the rich people. What? Do the uh, rich guys come round here and park up their cars, play music, and yeah, hang out. Job, you know? When I was like these people, <laughs> I was exactly the same way. <laughs> Can you believe it's two different worlds? <laughs> Can you believe it? Huh? Can, I, can, I, can I be completely honest with you? Yes. Two. When you spoke about rich people, in my head, I had white people. Yeah, not at and all, eh? They're all, they're all black guys. They're all black guys. They're all black guys. Look at those people there, most of them are young people. So, they're getting what they deserve now. Fairness. Is this fair? Their moms and dads wasn't treated this way. They wouldn't have been allowed to come in here. So them enjoying their freedom, there's nothing wrong with that. You should go and ask them what they think about coronation. And you'll get your answer. I'm gonna do that now. Hello guys, how are you doing? Hello. Hello. Where have you guys come from tonight? Soweto. Soweto? Yes. So you guys are from the township? Yes. Nice, and you come out here to enjoy yourself for the night? Yes. <laughs> South Africa has come a long way. Some middle class black people live in Soweto now, with cars, jobs and money. And whilst it's strange to think this party wouldn't have even been allowed 20 years ago, it's even stranger that it is happening right next to the tents and shacks of hundreds of impoverished Afrikaners. There's a group of people living just over there. Permanently uh, standing, they uh, live uh, there. living there or what? You didn't, you didn't know that they, that they were there? No, I didn't know anything because this is a park. Mm. I'm living in that squatter camp tonight. You won't get white people here. You understand? Because what do you do? You won't get white people living in the park? You won't. Well, I'm Did you prove tonight. something? I'm standing there tonight and there's a lot. A, okay, white people that are standing, you know, white people that are living there, they are th three days and then they are going home. No, eight years. No, you're lying. You don't believe that there could be that many white people living that way over there? Why not? I don't believe. Why not? I'm, I'm telling you straight, you're lying. No. I came over this hill expecting sort of arrogant, rich white kids. <laughs> it was quite the opposite. 
white families still earn six times more than black ones on average. So I can understand the stereotypes. I hold them too. But if black people can't even accept white poverty, I can't see a way out for JD, Hardis, and Khiri. I'm on my way back to see Hardis. I'm surprised to hear he's been given a last minute job interview. It could be good news, but I'm finding it hard to be positive. I see his kids walking around barefoot and I see used needles in the gutter and drug dealers hanging out seconds from his open doorway. It just really gets you down. It just makes you think, Jesus. That's interesting. There are police. Wow. Lots of police. I'm gonna go and find out what's going on. Excuse me, officer. If you go inside that side in that building, all the people is inside there. Has there something happened in that building? I don't know if something's happened, but all the blind people are inside that building. Okay. Well, thank you. Something's going on. Hey, Haris. What's up? You all right, man? Yeah. So what's, what's that? Bring me a They're busy doing a raid. For drug dealing? Uh, drugs, um, cigarettes. If you got a shop, if they find any cigarettes on you, they're going to confiscate it. Why are you guys there, man? Well, luckily, I'm a smoker, so I'm just going to say I smoke it. Uh, Vivian, I noticed that your, uh, your shop signs come down. So if they'd seen the sign, what would have happened? They will search the room. If they find anything, they will lock me up. Vivian. Or they will give me a fine. Vivian and Hardis have been lucky, but escaping arrest isn't how I choose to prepare for a job interview. It's going to look like the Rainbow Nation today. Oh, really? Why is Blue that? shoes with black. Crazy yeah. colours. Yeah. Do you not have any blacks and whites? No. There's yes. dark. There we go. That work? <laughs> it's funny, no matter where you are in the world, there's wives still dressing their husbands. Bye bye, Sienna. See, no, no. Hardis is interviewing for a door to door sales job. Looking sharp, hello. Look at you. All right, let's go do this. <laughs> it's a massive opportunity that doesn't come around very often. I applied for this job two years ago. Wow. Two years ago, and they finally um, called got you out back of the to blue. Yeah. Oh, this is a good 30 minute drive from your place. How are you going to get here should you get the job? Walk. This is going to be a long walk, isn't it? <sighs> get those nerves. You'll be fine. Sorted out. You'll be fine. So what's the situation with um, AA? I'm hoping that there's no, no such thing in, in this opportunity. Even if there is, I'm still hoping that um, I get con I, I convince them to actually give me the chance. This is the first time I've actually seen him appear unsure about something, you know? In any scenario, you'd sort of understand, but in this one, there's so much more on his shoulders, you know? It's not just someone trying to get a job to earn some money to pay for their satellite subscription. I really hope Hardis can get his dream job. But competition is tough. This is just the first of three interviews he'll have to ace to stand a chance. Even if he does succeed, his ultimate goal is not just to leave his home, but to take his family out of South Africa. Like many Afrikaners I've spoken to, he's fearful for the future. I've come to a rally for a popular movement called EFF that's taking South Africa's poor black youth by storm. The Red Berets think affirmative action hasn't gone far enough. They're demanding more extreme measures to help black people out of poverty, like taking back farmland and nationalizing lucrative mines. We are going to take that belongs to us. They've become controversial for singing an apartheid rebellion song, Shoot the Boer, Kill the Farmer. Viva EFF, viva! Old women to little viva kids, Africa. they're all screaming. Viva, viva, viva EFF. Viva. Just because there's now a black government doesn't mean poor black Africans aren't still suffering or angry. We're going on 20 years of so-called independence. I'm only free to sit next to a white person on a bus, but I got no income, I got no money. I cannot buy anything for my children. My children just watch life going by. Talk to people like Hardis. 
you sort of get an idea that he feels like he's not part of what's happening in South Africa. He's no different to the people here, you know, they feel just as marginalised, just as, as not listened to and just as ignored, you know? People here want change, and there's a militancy in the air. Look at that, look. When their commander-in-chief, Julius Malema, turns up, he gets a welcome that David Cameron could only dream of. You must not sit back. Come on, sir. Pull out the guitar. Hello, yeah. This the poor. The farmer. This the poor. The farmer. The whole time I've been here, I've heard about this Kill the Boer song. Uh, clearly, Malemba has become hip to that because, you know, it's something that's really sensitive to the, uh, the Boer and Afrikaans population out here. He's now changed the words of the song to kiss the Boer. The funny thing is that's quickly followed by uh, people going pow, pow. Different words, pretty much the same meaning, you know? I've never seen any politician in Britain do was sing with the people and sing traditional songs. Yeah, yeah. And he sang the, the Kill the Boer song, but he uh, changed the words to Kiss the Boer. Yes. No, do you to, think it's a fair song? Boer. Yeah, it's a fair song. We are kissing the knowledge. We do not want to fight. We want to fight spiritually, not physically. We don't want to fight with guns and whatever. We have to fight knowledgeable, uh, 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 knowledgeably. And we, we have to fight with knowledge. I don't want to believe that everyone here wants to take violent revenge on white people, but chanting a hate song isn't building any bridges. A few years ago, Julius Malema was tipped as a future president, but he's not someone many people in Coronation Park would vote for. Why do you think that so many black people in townships are supporting of Malema? Because they want to kill us. <laughs> it's a shock, eh? I definitely don't agree. He says kill the boot, kill the white one, kill the boot, kill the white one. They're going to kill us. They're going to kill us. As soon as he comes in, we're going to be killed. Our fathers before our fathers treated black people very bad. They did. And I think Julius Malema wants to just turn it around. But it's wrong. It's wrong. So why do you want to treat us uh, like dead because of what happened that time of year? It was a long time ago, but it's not that long ago. The fact that people are still alive who remember apartheid is a problem. The fact that there are still people who are holding on to feelings from that era is a problem. And that is why there are some people, not all people, some people who feel a level of resentment and why there is anger between blacks and whites. <laughs> This would act like blood, in, blood, blood is blood and flesh is flesh, so just leave it. There are lessons in what happened, and I think the only way that you move forward is learning from what happened as opposed to forgetting. You know Stupid, man. These people in this world, that's why the world is like it is, because they can't forgive and forget what happened in their lives. That's why the world is a fuck up. Straight talking, breaking no friendship. That's why the world is fucked up. But to forget what's happened will be completely irresponsible because then you can't learn from what went wrong. And that is why, wait, hear, hear me I out, Irene. Hear me out, hear me out, Irene. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, I told yeah, you now no. what I think about the life. Yeah. I told you everything I know, everything that I know, everything I want to say to you. Yeah. And that's that. We're not going to agree we on it. We will never agree. <laughs> never. Let me tell you one thing, my friend. We will never agree. Forgiving and forgetting is, um, is not the way I live my life. I mean, I've got a tattoo on my arm that says, never regret, never forget, you know? Um, I think it's important that you don't forget. It's definitely important that you forgive, and that's the only way that things are going to change here, if people forgive. But you must never forget. Because if you forget, what the hell are you going to learn? There is no quick fix for the divisions and inequality in South Africa. The poor Afrikaners I've met are undoubtedly getting a rough deal now. 
But if there is a price to pay for decades of oppression, perhaps this is the least worst option. In Pretoria, Hardis has asked me to meet him after making it through to the final interview for his sales job. OK, so today was the big day. Got some bad news and some good news. OK, uh, bad news first. I need to wake up early tomorrow morning. Best news, I get to start working on my birthday, which is tomorrow. <laughs> God, that's incredible. That's unbelievable. Congratulations. What a birthday present. Yeah, it is. It's... Uh, I really didn't expect this. What does this mean for you and your family, then? Better life, which is what I've been hoping for, what I've been dreaming for. Yeah. Does Vivian know yet? No. That's not like quite what? foreseeable, obvious. Hello, <laughs> Hoo. Congratulations, Vivian. Big news. What's the first thing you want to do? Just get out of this place. Move to a flat or something. Yeah. I can't let them grow up here in this place. Yeah. When I got the yes uh, after I left the office, it was... It just... It, it felt like I was taking a huge load of stuff just off my shoulders. So, it, it's a big change for me. I'm still going to make it, I'm still going to do it. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Take care. Best of luck, OK? <laughs> OK, thank you. Take care. <laughs> See you later, little man. Bye-bye. See you later. Yeah. Should I yeah. get a hug? Oh, do I get a hug? Yeah. <laughs> See you later. Bye. See you later, little monkey. Bye. Bye. <laughs> See you later, honey. Bye, monkey. Bye-bye. Bye. I'm really pleased that Hardest, at least, has made a positive change. I'd come here hoping to see a rainbow nation, but there's clearly some way to go. Integration is happening, but only in pockets. And I'm surprised it's the poor Afrikaners who feel they don't belong in South Africa anymore. Essentially, black and white people are victims of apartheid and they're still feeling the effects of it. It's a, a problem that's affected poor, rich, white and black. Do you think that you're a victim? of apartheid still? Definitely my generation paying a price. We're paying a price for our forefathers. South Africa's past is still haunting it. But it won't be like that always. Change takes time. It really does. Happy? Very happy. I look 10 years younger. It's amazing. Nice work, eh? Thanks. <laughs> See you later, guys. Bye. Always look to the trees and to the sky. Remember us then. Too. It's a bit weird um, seeing them react the way that they have to me. And it's a I, if I'm going to be really honest, I feel a bit strange leaving. I mean, not that I want to stay here, but... You know, I'm going home, and I know what I'm going home to. And, um, they're staying here, I mean, staying here in this, you know? This is how kids play here, this is the reality for them here, and... Good people. Really good people. My time in Coronation Park and Joburg has come to an end. The people I've been living with are in a very difficult position, but they still have made me very welcome, and that's important. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care, OK? I will. During the years of apartheid, I wouldn't have even been allowed to step foot in this park. And that is progress, at least for me.